Welcome back to the Cribsiders. This is a Medscape video recap summary of one of our most recent podcast episodes. Justin, what topic are we reviewing today? So we had a great topic that was part of the Nef Madness uh, event on social media, a nephrology topic, chronic, chronic kidney disease in the pediatric population. We had a amazing fellow who came on to teach us all about CKD. She is AC Gomez. She was a superstar and a really great guest. Justin, I guess let's just jump right in. Uh, first question, what is CKD? So this was, you know, is actually a tougher question than uh, it may first appear to a lot of trainees. You know, often we learn that any EGFR, any estimated GFR less than 60 is considered chronic kidney disease. And, and that's right in that if you have a poor renal function, that can be chronic kidney disease. But there's a whole other section of chronic kidney disease, especially in pediatric populations, uh, that are defined by any type of structural or abnormality in the kidney. And so that can be a horseshoe kidney, that can be a transplanted kidney, that can be something like Alport syndrome that we talked about, where there's a basement membrane defect. Um, this can be like a IgA nephropathy or some other glomerular nephropathy, where the creatinine may still actually be normal, but there is some kidneys issues, there are chronic kidney disease, and their chronic kidney disease stage one. Uh, that was an important topic too, was talking about staging of chronic kidney disease. That is based on the estimated EGFR. We talked about doing a little clock drawing of 12, nine, six, three. You can check it out in the uh, show notes, but the staging of chronic kidney disease completely based on estimated GFR rates. Okay, but the definition is actually a little more inclusive than just having a EGFR less than 60. Okay, okay. Uh, how do these kids present? This was also something that seems like a very simple question, but uh, came with a lot of uh, different presentations. One of the ones that uh, we learned, a typical presentation of something like Alport syndrome is actually from a child uh, having speech delay and, and then going on to have a hearing test and having some hearing loss and ultimately diagnosed with this excellent condition of Alport syndrome, which is, is not that uncommon. Other kiddos might present with hematuria or proteinuria with some foamy urine. And one of the big takeaways, I think, was that this is often a hereditary uh, disease or many of these glomerular nephropathies, many of these chronic kidney diseases in pediatrics can be inherited. And so there's a big importance of taking a good family history. One of the favorite anecdotes that uh, AC shared with us was as a pediatric nephrologist, she's often not just taking the urine of the patient, but collecting urines from everyone in the room, from the parents to, you know, determining, uh, you know, what the urine looks like. Are there early signs of hereditary forms of, of pathology in the kidneys. And one other pearl on this too is that you might see hematuria or even proteinuria in inpatient settings, uh, but really any abnormality needs to be repe uh, repeated in the outpatient setting. That's where we can really get a valid urine to see if there's anything going on. Okay. So speaking of urine and proteinuria, uh, when you actually are looking for proteinuria, is a spot test okay or do we need to all be getting 24-hour urine tests? So this was a question that I think we asked her and then everyone kind of braced for the answer, hoping that she said a spot urine was fine, confirmed, nephrologists approve, the spot urine is being very accurate. With some exceptions, for example, if a patient has a known acute kidney disease or acute kidney injury in the hospital, for example, that's when a 24-hour urine might be a little bit more accurate, but, but the spot urine's okay for, for the rest of us. Perfect. That is great news. A lot, lot easier to collect. Um, so if we have a patient with CKD, what should we be monitoring? And this was kind of a big crutch of the, the interview as well, and that chronic kidney disease is very chronic. And a lot of the things we do are, first are just close monitoring. The monitoring first, I'd say, depends on the stage of kidney disease. So if it's a chronic kidney disease stage one or two, we're going to be checking basic labs really just annually. But if we're getting the kidney disease uh, stage three, we might do it every six months. Chronic kidney disease four, we might do it every three months. And chronic kidney disease stage five, monthly. So I'm talking about the frequency, but like, what are we looking for? And it's really the core electrolyte complications of chronic kidney disease. So one of the first uh, that we all learned that is a major uh, health clinical complication of chronic kidney disease is hyperkalemia or measuring for potassium. And so we're monitoring potassium at these intervals 
And we learned that about 5.5 in pediatrics is where we really start to get worrisome. And then we think about starting a child on potassium binders that will bind up that potassium and definitely doing some dietary guidance. We also look at phosphorus, although phosphorus is very age dependent on what the upper limit of normal is. But if it's too elevated, that's when phosphate binders come into play as treatment for elevated phosphate. For acidosis, bicarb supplementation might be needed. And for the anemia of chronic disease or iron deficiency anemia, both common complications of chronic kidney disease, erythropoietin might be needed if a hemoglobin drops below 10, or if iron um, deficient, they can start with an iron supplement, IV iron working a little bit better in patients with chronic kidney disease. But these are the things we're basically monitoring to, to see if they need intervention. Okay. So lots of electrolytes and, and labs that you need to be monitoring in CKD. Um, what about bone health? Why do CKD patients tend to have uh, bone This was also a fun topic to, to dive into. Uh, first and foremost, there's always some growth issues in people with uh, pretty significant chronic kidney disease, and that's because there is some growth hormone resistance, and that can cause problems and may even need growth hormone supplementation in some of these patients. But we also had a great review over the, the mineral and bone disease complications of chronic kidney disease. And I remember this is sometimes one of my favorite questions for medical students is why might the ALKFOS be elevated in a uh, patient with chronic kidney disease? And the answer is that it can be a sign of bone resorption. And so we went through the pathophysiology of how the kidneys activate vitamin D uh, and that can help increase uh, calcium. And basically, if you're having kidney function that prevents this... Um, uh, calcium absorption, you'll have an increase in PTH, the parathyroid hormone, which will try to balance out the potassium, uh, balance out the calcium, and that leads to an increase in bone resorption and can cause some bone mineral disease. Uh, this is why it's important to monitor vitamin D levels, to monitor the PTH. And one of the things we talked about is uh, with the PTH, that's where imp uh, acting on the phosphate can actually help balance an elevated PTH to try to prevent some of these complications. So very complicated pathophysiology, but AC did a great job of kind of walking us through it in a, in a very simple way. Perfect. Well, let's move away from the pathophysiology uh, uh, for a minute and, and chat a little bit about how pediatric CKD actually goes on to affect adults. You know, we took advantage of having a MedPeds dual specialized guest and talked about how children with chronic kidney disease are four times more likely to develop end-stage renal disease or develop dialysis, essentially, and that often occurs earlier in life. And so it was really this big focus on the transition from pediatric to adult nephrologists and how important that is to prevent progressions. One of the cool uh, pearls that she shared with us is the website gottransitions.org, which has really been something... Uh, that she uh, suggested everyone check out to really help with kind of transitions for some of these complex patients. Great. As a med peds doctor, I love I love chatting about transitions. So um, I think that's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us for another Medscape video recap of the Cribsiders Pediatric Podcast. To listen to the full episode, you can download this episode and others on any podcast player or check it out on our website, www.cribsiders.com. And thank you so much for tuning in. Thank <laughs> you.